Um, so um, I would like to be able to call the meeting to order. Um, Janice, do, does it look well? We'll just go ahead and start and then we'll we'll do roll call and play. So just good morning, everyone. And, and thank you for participating in our virtual meeting here at the Riverside County Habitat Conservation Agency Board. Just remember to silence all of your little devices um, before we begin. And um, during the meeting, all participants except for the presenter and myself will be placed on mute. So thank you for being here today. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Tom Riches of the city of Corona, if he would be willing to give, lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. So you could take yourself off of mute. Okay. All right, thank you. If everyone will please stand and uh, put your arm over your heart and look at the flag on the screen and I will start us off. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And you can be seated. Thank you so much for doing that. Janice, would you please conduct the roll call? Absolutely. When I call your jurisdiction, please say your name. City of Corona. Here. Or Tom. Thank you, sir. Hemet. Russ Brown here. Lake Elsinore. Steve Manos. Manafi. Here. Marino Valley. David Marquez. Murrieta. I see Dr. DeForest is connecting. I'll come back to get an audio from her. Paris. Mayor Vargas. Sorry, I was on mute. Michael Vargas. Thank you, sir. Uh, Murrieta. Here. Thank you. Riverside. Temecula. Marianne here. Wildemar. Joseph Morabito. And County District 5. Uh, Jeff Hewitt here. That concludes roll call and we have form. Okay, thank you so much, Janice. So under public comments at this time, members of the public can address the board regarding any items listed on, not any items. Is it supposed to be not listed on the agenda? Yeah, I think so. Members of the public will have an opportunity to speak on agendized items at the time of the items that are called for discussion. So no action may be taken on items not listed on the agenda unless authorized by law. Whenever possible, lengthy testimony should be presented to the board in writing and only power, um, pertinent points presented orally. For guest speakers of the public comments, please adhere to the speaker time of three minutes. Please treat others with courtesy, civility, and respect for our, our public process. Janice, are there any public comments today? I have no requests. Okay, thank you. That long sentence, and then we had no one. Um, okay, consent, consent and policy calendar. All items listed under the consent and policy calendar are considered routine and may be enacted one motion in one motion. Prior to the motion, to consider any action by the board and public comments of any of the consent items will be heard. Does anyone wish to pull any consent item for discussion? I see no requests. Okay, I do have one request and that is to pull item D, the financial report through September 30th, 2021. Can I get a motion on this and a second to approve the consent policy calendar without that item? District I, Moreno Valley. Yeah, you got, you got first, second and third there, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I have district five as motion and Moreno Valley as second. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's to approve all but D. Correct. Right. City of Corona. Aye. Hemet. Yes. Lake Elsinore. Yes. Menifee. Yes. Marino Valley. Yes. Murrieta. Yes. Paris. Yes. Riverside. Temecula. Aye. Wildemar. Yes. District 5. Yes. Okay, those items pass unanimously. Thank you. So, um, so can I um, just, can you pull up the financial uh, report? We don't have that in the actual PowerPoint, Rian. Are you able to pull that up in the uh, agenda and share your screen? 
So unless you just want, unless I, I would like, um, I can't get it either because I've gone, I'm on, I got two screens going here. Um, I did just notice, and maybe you can just answer. I noticed that um, a lot of the proposed amounts are much larger than they were for last year. For, um, for instance, the audit services professionals was 20,000 for this year. Maybe we didn't have to do an audit last year. Um, subscriptions and publications went from five, and I wasn't sure if that was $5, but it went to 500. Postage was up to one, uh, 1,500, printing 5,000. Um, miscellaneous office equipment was 500 where there wasn't before. Communication cell phone went up to $10,000 and special program expenses was 20,000. Those are just a few of the things that I saw that I wrote down. Um, and I just was wondering if there might be a reason for it. Am I reading it right? Not sure. There we go. If I could maybe jump in. Um, good afternoon, or yeah, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, Andrew Ruiz, CFO with WRCOG. So actually, Lisa, what you're looking at is the actual column. You'll note at the very top um, of the report are the actual expenses that were incurred. And then in the middle column is actually the budget. Um, and then the column to the very right is the variance. Right. So I'm looking from, okay, so if you go to the top, looking from last year, the actual expense, and then budget amount for this year, are the budget amounts much larger than they were for the year before? So, so the, these are the actual amounts expensed in the current fiscal year, not from the prior fiscal year. So from the first quarter of fiscal year 21, 22, these are the actual expenses. And then where it says budget, okay. that's the All ending right. I, Okay, I was reading it wrong. I was reading it like those were the expenses for the end of the fiscal year and then these. So I apologize. I'm glad you explained that. That was my question. So I will move then that we approve item D on a consent. Second, Paris. Okay. Roll call, Janice. Thank you, City of Corona. Aye. Hemet. Yes. Lake Elsinore? Yes. Menifee? Yes. Moreno Valley? Yes. Murrieta? Yes. Paris? Yes. Riverside? Temecula? Aye. Wildemar? Yes. And County? Yes. Thank you, and that passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go to item six, reports and discussions. So item six is an update from Brian Schumel on staff efforts and meetings to discuss opportunities regarding species recovery efforts for the Stevens kangaroo rat. After the presentation, um, we'll take any, any comments. Thank you, Madam Chair Sobeck. Um, item 6A before you today. Uh, it's really just a quick update on what we've achieved so far towards recovery. As, as the board recalls, we were expecting to have the final downlisting rule published in the Federal Register at the end of September. Unfortunately, there was delays uh, on the Fish and Wildlife Services end uh, that have pretty much pushed it out till the November, you know, the end of November. We expect it within the next week. Uh, we're in regular communication with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They anticipate that it's still on schedule, um, but uh, we're still kind of at their mercy. And so we're looking forward to it being downlisted. It appears to be on schedule to be published by the end of November, but we're still waiting for it. Um, in the meantime, they have clarified some of the actions that will be uh, attached to that under the 4D rule. So when you downlist a species from endangered to threatened, they can make certain exceptions uh, that won't have to go through the normal bureaucratic authorization of the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They are automatically kind of approved. Uh, these actions could result in take of a listed species. So we could either harm them directly or indirectly. Uh, but these actions now will help speed up recovery uh, moving forward once approved. And you'll see those items down below. So research such as genetics and translocation. If you recall in the past, uh, RCHCA has funded a lot of genetics research and a lot of big translocation research uh, with San Diego uh, Zoo's Global Alliance uh, conservation efforts down there. If we would have to move those in the future uh, as an endangered species without this 4D rule, we would have to do a lot of approval process going through US Fish and Wildlife Service. That may take years. Uh, under the 4D rule, we can now move them quite 
a bit more easily. Uh, other things that are going to be included are management. Uh, for instance, SKR management, technically under the SK, SKR HCP, has no authorization for take. Um, and cattle grazing is not an approved uh, form of SKR management at this point. Sheep grazing is, but cattle grazing has shown benefits. So they're going to approve that. Wildfire management activities, uh, non-native invasive noxious plant removal, uh, habitat restoration, survey and monitoring work, which will be a big deal going forward uh, with full recovery plans. We're going to have to ramp up our monitoring efforts. And currently, the only few people that are able to do it are those with special uh, federal and state permits. And so under this rule, potentially, they're looking into it, is allowing the RCHCA to act as an entity that if you're an employee for, with the RCHCA, even a seasonal or temporary employee, you can work under the guidance of, say, me or Harry, who has full permitting uh, with the state and the feds. And so that'll help us monitor a lot of the SKR grids going forward uh, for recovery to demonstrate recovery. Um, and then finally, just a control of unauthorized public access, which is signing, fencing, gates. Um, you know, it seems kind of ridiculous, but if you pound a fence post, post in the ground, potentially you can pound it into a borough, even though you're doing good by trying to keep out illegal public access. Um, it technically needs to be authorized to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service if it's happening in SKR habitat. Going forward, we can do these activities uh, without going through the full permitting process of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So these actions are great. Uh, we hope to see it at the end of November. Once these are all implemented, I'm sure it'll speed up the recovery efforts moving forward. So at this time, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. This is a receiving file. Thank you, Brian. Um, Janice, are there any members from the public who've joined us? Um, well, Director Edwards has her hand raised. Okay, so any, I, uh, so I just was wondering if there was any questions or comments first from the public, and if not, then we'll go to board member questions. Yeah, I have no requests from the public. Okay, Marianne. Thank you. So Brian, basically, it's going to allow us to do what we know that we need to do without having to ask permission. Exactly. Without having to conduct a whole HCP or other right. permitting problems, uh, we can just get the work done and move forward uh, much more quickly. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Any great. other questions? All right. This is a receiving file. So thank you, Brian. Okay. We're going to move to item B. Um, and uh, this will be a presentation by Harry Sandoval on information on RCA management and coordination efforts occurring for RCHC owned lands at the Lake Matthews and Still Peak Reserves. Okay, Harry, it's good to see you. Likewise, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick update here on uh, reserve management and monitoring. So uh, last uh, during our last board meeting, we talked about some encroachment issues that we had uh, with some of our properties. And today I just wanted to give an update on some of the actions that have taken place. We've actually been able to resolve two of the three outstanding encroachments that we had. Uh, the first one here is uh, was the illegal cannabis operation that was partially taking part on RCHCA owned lands. Uh, we reported this to CDFW. We provided some geospatial data and some other information for CDFW Law Enforcement Division. Uh, they actually invited RCHCA staff to go out uh, during the raid of this site. And uh, some of the images you see here are some photos that I took while we were on the raid. So it was a small cannabis operation, approximately a little bit over uh, an acre in size. However, it was very environmentally destructive. Uh, as you can see here, there's lots of uh, chemicals, there's pesticides, herbicides, uh, rodenticides, uh, gasoline, motor oil being spread out throughout the site, along with uh, human waste from the, the camping that was taking place on the site. Uh, they did destroy some habitat. There is an oak woodland that was impacted by this, along with the other uh, destruction areas that were destroyed uh, to put in the plants themselves. Uh, you can see the picture on the right, there is a stream bed that actually is on RCHCA property. Uh, they, for the operation, they were siphoning water from the stream bed to, uh, and channeling, uh, channeling that into a basin, which they dug on their property to uh, essentially water their crop. Uh, they also dug an 80 foot well onto RCHCA property. And that's the picture you see all the way on the left there. So. Uh, they were actually taking subterranean water from RCHCA land and pumping it up to their property to uh, irrigate their crops as well. Uh, so thankfully, with everything, with all the information that we provided and all the coordination, 
uh, CDFW law enforcement, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and county code enforcement uh, were able to make a few arrests. There were some charges uh, that were pressed against the landowners as well. And uh, everything has been removed and there is an order in place to restore the site back to its native condition. Uh, the RCHCA property is now secure as well. We've removed all everything that was on our site. And so we've remediated this and we've put up new signs and are monitoring for any more trespassing activities. But uh, thankfully we can uh, call this one done and resolved at this point. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another encroachment that we had here uh, on the Lake Matthews property. Uh, this was an adjacent landowner who had uh, essentially claimed about five acres of land uh, from the reserve. He originally sold this property uh, during, the, um, during the SKR plan's inception back in the mid-90s. Uh, over time, he'd gradually uh, gone back onto this property, graded out a pad for a home site, essentially, and used it as a kind of, a, kind of an orchard. He had a couple fruit trees and things on there. Uh, so we've been negotiating essentially with him and trying to get his uh, property off our land so that we could uh, re uh, put this back essentially into the reserve. So we have already restored a portion of a drainage which was disturbed by some illegal dumping. Uh, now we've kind of completed this as well. As you can see from the photos there, we had a, a Cal Fire Department of Correction inmates install about 850 feet of post and cable fence around the property. Uh, we also removed about 20 large invasive Peruvian pepper trees that were planted over the years on the property as well. So we're in kind of in the final stages of restoration here. Uh, we've added this land back into the reserve and now our final step, uh, now that the property is secure, we are gonna take on a full restoration of the site and uh, the areas that were graded for roads and uh, the home site will be restored with native uh, vegetation the next coming months here. So at least two of our three encroachments have now been resolved. Uh, the last one is still the most difficult that we're dealing with. Uh, you may recall as a property in, uh, around the city of Hemet, which has a house constructed actually on RCHCA land. Uh, we're still working on an encroachment policy and we hope to bring that uh, to you in the near future so we could resolve that final, um, final issue that we have. All right, next slide, please. Uh, finally, uh, management activities. So last time as well, we talked about all the mapping and all the data that we've collected on invasive species in particular stink net here at the Lake Matthews Reserve. So now we're actually using that data and incorporating it back into our management. And uh, we're trying a new technique here, which we hope is gonna make a great impact in uh, how we manage and uh, how we try to eradicate stink net. And we're hoping that this process catches on and can be used by our partner ag agencies in the uh, SKR reserve system. So with all the data that we've collected over the years, we have a really good idea of where uh, stink net is occurring. So we're now using a new herbicide, which was uh, recommended by the trials that were done by the University of California at Riverside here. And we're using a pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, what this pre-emergent herbicide is going to do is it's going to limit uh, germination. So essentially, we're not going to have any new plants coming up in the areas that we treat. And, and we're treating areas where we know this weed exists. Uh, what that's going to do is it's going to give us the opportunity to uh, not worry about the plants coming up at this site that'll allow us to go out and find new areas of infestation. So essentially we're getting ahead of the curve now. Uh, we're finding this plant before it establishes, establishes itself and makes a, like a, like a large colony. So this new technique is just providing us more time to concentrate on other areas that can become problematic so that we can avoid the whole uh, life cycle there. And hopefully we're breaking this and making a good impact in the future here. And I believe that's it for me today. Yep, this is a receive and file. I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any out there. Okay, thank you so much, Harry, on that great report. Um, have any members from the public joined us, Janice? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, so do we have any board members have any questions or comments for Harry on this item? 
Director okay, Morbido. I, I see a hand. Yes, Joseph Morbido. Hi there. Hi, Harry. Um, I hope I didn't miss this part of the, uh, if you already mentioned this, but uh, with the cannabis part, where generally were those pictures taken? Which area? Yeah, apologies for that. That was in the uh, Estelle Mountain portion of the reserve. So that was, if I had to describe it, a uh, little bit closer to the city of Paris, to the city limits of Paris. Um, we, I don't know if there's a really good reference over there, but we're close to, uh, yeah, Brian, I see. <laughs> yeah, just a real, it's off Lake Matthews Drive uh, up in the Gavilan Hills area, uh, just outside this, the, I'd say the unincorporated area of uh, Paris uh, in the county of Riverside uh, jurisdiction. So if you know, do you know where the reserve office is here? I think so off near Lake Matthews. Yeah, so Lake Matthews is a lake. It's about, oh, five miles south of us as the crow flies. Uh, if you go directly south of the lake in the Estelle Mountain area, um, it's right in those hills. I appreciate it. It gives me an idea, a general idea. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And um, Russ Brown from Hemet. Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you for the uh, proactive uh, activities on uh, on the uh, cannabis operations and the intrusions. Uh, I just have one question about the uh, stink net reduction efforts with uh, pre-emergent herbicide. Yeah. Uh, as a Vietnam veteran, I'm always uh, a little sensitive to the use of herbicides. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how tried and tested this product was uh, prior to uh, implementation? Sure. So uh, it is a very well-known product. It is a product that uh, is used widely. Uh, in fact, uh, Riverside County Transportation Department uses it along roadways. Uh, it is approved for wildland areas such as we have here. And it is comparable in the level of safety of all the other products that we use, of all the other herbicides that we use here. So uh, on the Essentially, on the level of severity, it is, uh, we go by caution words, essentially, on the labels here. This is the lowest kind of caution word or the lowest kind of caution formulation that is available. Uh, we don't use any, we try to avoid using anything that is dangerous or that could have detrimental impacts on the environment. The only kind of area of concern with this product is that it does linger in the environment a little bit longer than the other herbicides that we use, but that is by design. Uh, since it blocks germination, it has to be in the soil uh, longer to maintain its stability. So that's really the only detrimental effect, but we're always cautious as to where we spray this or where we use this product so that it doesn't, let's say, migrate into a waterway or anything like that that could move downstream and cause any potential effects. So yeah, we're very cautious. We don't like using herbicides, but it is probably our, the most cost-effective way of, uh, of dealing with this particular weed. Well, I, I know that is a, it's a troublesome weed to try to eradicate and, and I hope it proves out to, to be effective. I just uh, wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can to monitor any percolation into the, the groundwater table too. Absolutely, and because we work uh, next to a reservoir here, we even have a higher level of uh, responsibility to make sure that we spray responsibly. We, we only, uh, I know Brian and myself are qualified applicators. We have certificates with the state of California. So we're very cautious about what we do around the water supply around here as well. Right. And we hope to, we hope that this new process that we have is going to actually in the future limit the total amount of herbicides that we use. Uh, a lot of this stems from being able to map it so efficiently. We know exactly where it is, so we're not going out and using tons of this. It's very focused applications that we're doing. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, Harry, I have, I have a couple questions. On the cannabis, is there an opportunity for reimbursement to the MSHCP from that property owner on anything that uh, you will have to do? that is financially involved? I don't believe so. And thankfully the, the impacts to our property were mostly related to the well and some minor chemical uh, spillage. 
I don't believe that there is going to be anything that we can do about the, the waterway. Um, and even CDFW uh, law enforcement division was kind of, uh, they're iffy on if the, the, uh, the enforcement action is actually going to stick uh, to the issues related to the waterway. Uh, we could look into to it further to see if there is anything. Uh, but as far as we know, most of the operation took place on private property and kind of the, the RCHCA property was used mostly as a conduit essentially for the operation. But uh, we could follow up with CDFW and see if there's anything that we could do. Yeah, you just had mentioned the oil or was that oil on the, I, I don't know if there was cleanup that would be involved or anything. So just right. they would be right. held responsible. So. Thankfully, most of it was on private property. Okay. Uh, oil on our property was mostly related to equipment that they were using to pump water onto their property. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then the second question, again, on that um, herbicide, um, you mentioned that um, Riverside Transportation uses the same product. UCR has researched it, da, da, da. Um, are you working, are other agencies as well being informed of this? Like, for instance, in, my, in the city of Menifee, I noticed we have an Edison easement and you know how that those seeds are tracked as they go from one area of this of the county to another and we have a whole area that is just just so much stinkweed and so is this information being shared so it's just not being shared in a silo type of thing that we're trying to eradicate this countywide sure at this point uh, I know it's it's uh in fact, I know the study that UCR here, that UCR did, that the RC, RCHCA funded, has been widely disseminated. I don't know if local governments were privy to that information or were at the locations where this information was, uh, was uh, distributed. Uh, as for us, the RCHCA, we make sure that we present these studies and, and what's going on essentially what we're doing during the RMCC meetings, the, the Reserve Managers Coordinating Committee. So we know that all our, yeah, everyone in the interested parties essentially in the STR Reserve System is well aware of that. Um, I don't know if any other agencies are using it to the degree that we are or how we're using it. I know the BLM is or is planning to as well, but I'm not sure. To yeah. what level? And Perry, uh, I, I just wanted to add for everyone's benefit. Brian did come out. This, everyone, this, is, that. this is Chris Gray from WRCOG. Uh, Brian did come out and did a comprehensive presentation on Stinknet to WRCOG's public works directors, because they, you know, um, as as many of you know, it's the it's the public works directors that are overseeing road maintenance and, and facility maintenance. So we did we have made an effort to share this information throughout WRCOG as well. And in addition to that, we let all the public works department uh, folks who attended that meeting know that we have a website up uh, with different plant stages and life cycles and what treatment to use at that appropriate time. So they can do some scheduling. And if they wanted to, uh, they could purchase uh, this product. This product does have a caveat though, and it might not be appropriate for all public works departments. It is rather expensive. Uh, you're talking about what, about $3,000 for two and a half gallons. Uh, that makes a lot of solution. I mean, you mix it in, in a big water tank and it makes a lot of solution. Uh, the other caveat that we have to do when we spray it is it has to have a quarter inch of rain or water put on it uh, within a very limited amount of time. And so you have to basically put it on there before a rain event. And so sometimes it's, you know, it's tricky to do. Uh, there are other proof pre-emergence um, that may or may not work. This pre-emergent was actually designed because it was on MWD's uh, already approved product list to work within their property. So again, as Harry's pointed out, we have to be very aware that we're working around water reservoirs in a lot of our SKR reserves. And so MWD and the state of California and the EPA have done extensive studies to approve certain herbicides in certain areas. And so what I'm getting at is we, we let this information known to a lot of the public works folks uh, and we let them know basically how to treat it uh, but they're probably in a better position to know which herbicides to use in their various jurisdictions. Uh, this one's particularly effective, uh, but it does have some, you know, limitations as far as expense and having to put it down before rain. So. Okay. 
um, that's good information. I, I have one more question, but I'm gonna let Marianne uh, from Temecula uh, ask her question. In my official role as Mary Poppins, I would just like to note that this is one area where we are gaining more local control and probably the only area <laughs> Where we're, where we're where we're gaining more local control. So thank you, RCHCA. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm just wondering, um, is this is this information trying to eradicate this in the county? Is this is important enough where it would be good for us as board members to be able to share this with our own public works mm -hmm. um, departments? Could Absolutely. We, could we receive maybe a um, memo to pass on to them? I was just going to say that uh, UCR put a very nice comprehensive brochure together for us. Uh, we can certainly mail that out after the board meeting to each of you uh, to share with your public works departments. Uh, in addition, we will wind up, we let a lot of the utilities know, uh, but we can send it specifically uh, to SoCal Gas and Southern California Edison. Uh, you know, to remind them that it is a problem on utility right of ways and it spreads through our open space areas. Um, so we will certainly do that and we'll send it out after the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, good discussion. So thank you. We're going to move forward to item C and this is going to be presented by Brian Shermel on uh, update on the various tasks associated with the RCHC contracted land management activities. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, the most important thing under our contracts, uh, we, we, you know, we have various contracts out there for small amounts to large amounts. Uh, the big one that we've worked on so far since the last uh, board meeting has been, the, if you recall, the board approved a five-year contract with the Conservation Biology Institute uh, for five years of implement, implementing the SCAR range-wide management and monitoring plan. Uh, we worked on basically assembling the technical and implementation teams since that board meeting. Uh, and so the big question now, and I don't wanna put everybody to sleep with a lot of technical mumbo jumbo, but uh, we really have to define where the population units are within the overall SKR world. And so we have to combine the genetics with some habitat suitability models and kind of really flesh out the details. And once we have that, then we can, start adding how many grids we have to have to monitor it to tell, you know, it's trend over time. Is the population going up or is it going down? Um, and so that's some very technical stuff. And so we have Wayne Spencer of CBI, who's very good at stats and modeling. We also brought in a guy, some of you may have been around long enough to remember, Doug Deutschman. Uh, he and Diffen, a guy by the name of Dr. Diffendorfer did a lot of the early SKR research and came up with some statistical models 20, 25 years ago. Marianne remembers. You remember? Yes. <laughs> he's <been around> <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's a great guy. He understands stuff and he's a real practical guy. Uh, so it's going to be important because we can come up with the greatest statistical model on the planet, but if we don't have enough labor and money to implement it, it does us no good. So the, the tricky part is going to find that balance and that's what we're pushing we need to find it statistically defensible so we can avoid all the frivolous type lawsuits and stuff that says we didn't do our good job of you know, monitoring these things. But at the same time, it has to be practical. And I think we assembled a really good team. We met on November 15th, uh, just a few days ago, and I'm really encouraged. Everybody's on the right page. We have the right people in the room. We have USGS in the room uh, with Dr. Robert Fisher. We have Dr. Deutschman, as I said, Wayne Spencer, myself. Uh, a lot of technical folks that can make it practical, but also make it defensible. And I think uh, we're going to hopefully have this all implemented and fleshed out by the start of the next monitoring season around April 2022. That's the goal uh, and to begin implementing this and looking forward to recovery actions. Uh, again, the future meetings are really going to focus on those statistical models. And it's something that, you know, uh, is really, really, really important if we're ever going to prove and demonstrate uh, irrefutably. Uh, that the SKR has recovered enough to warrant uh, delisting and full recovery. So any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. That's just kind of an overview in a nutshell. I didn't want to bore you with too many details, but I just want to assure you that it is moving along quite rapidly and we should have some really good updates uh, in the next few months and hopefully implementing this soon. So that's a receiving file, but again, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Do we have anyone from the public that would like to make a comment? Okay. No, oh, Madam Chair, we do not. 
and last call from the board. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. Okay, we're gonna move to item D, the Still Peak Public Access Plan Activities Update. So this, I'll turn this over to Brianna Fish Fisher with an update on the access plan. Thank you, Madam. Sorry for the background noise. I just wanted to give a brief update on the um, Steel Peak Inaugural Trail uh, Access Plan. So our CHCA has uh, completed its CEQA evaluation of uh, the trail with our uh, CEQA consultant, Ruthville Lobos and Associates, um, and a miti mitigated neck deck was declared in October. Uh, the CEQA document went out for public review for comments between October 8th and November 7th. Um, so our CHCA uh, did receive a, a joint 17-page comment from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, who did request a meeting to discuss the MND in further detail. Uh, some of the questions and concerns of the agencies uh, have were regarding the SKR, um, uh, oops, sorry, but the SKR fees to support the trail maintenance, um, the biological surveys needed to. Uh, to conduct the construction, the trail construction and the use impacts on the SKR populations uh, within the project area. Uh, so staff along with the uh, CEQA consultant are preparing for a meeting um, to meet with both agencies the first week in December and we'll hopefully resolve any concerns before the next board meeting in February. Um, after RCHCA consults with the regulatory agencies and receives concurrence from them, uh, the next steps will be to request the board to adopt the MND uh, and then send out a request for proposals uh, so that we can begin construction and design the trail signage. Uh, we are also working on the uh, lease with the County uh, Department of Waste Resources for the parking lot area, uh, which is being reviewed by their legal team at this time. Um, so, and that concludes my report. We are asking uh, the board to approve the Still Peak Final Trail Plan, which is included in the agenda packet. Okay, Rihanna, thank you. Um, it, I don't know what, was somebody using a garbage disposal there? <laughs> I thought somebody was asleep. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, there was a little background noise on your presentation, but what a beautiful pamphlet you put together. Um, is that a pamphlet you put together in the, the um, our packet that um, gave a lot of great information on the Steel Peak? So thank you for whoever put that together. It was really nice. So I just want to see if we have any public comments on this item. No, Madam Chair. Okay, if not, we'll see. Do we have any questions or comments by any of the board members? Marianne? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, I right. did, do I need to lower my hand? No, I just, no, I, you just went off a of mute, so I just didn't know. Okay. All right. Seeing none, we'll move on. And Madam finish. Chair, there is a requested action for this item. To oh, approve. Oh, yes. Oh, that's right. We will need to do a vote. So that's, why I, that's why I took the mute off. Move approval. <laughs> I'll second, second that, Joseph Morbido. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah, roll call. Thank you. Corona? Yes. Hemet? Yes. Lake Elsinore? Yes. Menifee? Yes. Moreno Valley? Yes. Marietta? Yes. Paris? Yes. Riverside? Temecula? Aye. Wildemar? Yes. And County? Yes. That concludes roll call vote for that item and it passes unanimously. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I do see there are three comments in the chat. I just want to bring attention to that. Um, and then we will now have a report and I don't think it's from our executive director because I believe we have Chris Gray here today. So will that be, or is Kurt, Kurt Wilson, who's gonna be doing this? I'm right here. Oh, there you are. Okay, <laughs> I saw Chris Gray earlier, so welcome. No problem, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so just two quick ones for you. One, just a, uh, a brief update. I had mentioned before the need to take a look at sort of the long-term uh, finances of the agency, uh, sort of our ability to uh, to withstand any particular changes that come up in the future related to development activity, that sort of thing, um, since that's tied to our primary source of income. Um, so that process is still underway. Um, just didn't want you to think that I'd forgotten about it, but it's something that I'm looking forward to bringing back to you uh, at some point next year. Um, and what makes it a little more complicated is sort of the uh, 
it, it is intertwined with what the HCP looks like long term uh, and sort of what obligations we have, what restrictions we have, um, what costs come along with that. So uh, we're looking forward to bringing together that sort of comprehensive look for you to examine and, and sort of use at a baseline as you go forward and make decisions related to the agency. And the only other thing I'd like to add is just sort of a, uh, just a heads up that you may be hearing from us related to the World Logistics Center. Um, as some of you may be aware, um, they have reached a settlement uh, among some other parties, um, but there may be some impacts to us as well. Um, so while today is not the day to go too deep into that piece, uh, I uh, just wanted to bring that to your attention because it is possible that at a future meeting uh, we will be uh, seeking some guidance or direction from you. And it's also possible that even prior to a future meeting, we may be sending some communication to you. And that will conclude my report, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and, and welcome today. And it's good to see you, Dr. Wilson. Okay. I. Um, Mayor Vargas, I've been trying to move along pretty quickly to get you out of here for your 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 uh, awards program. So we're almost we're almost done. So um, we just ask: Is there any items for future agendas at this point? Okay, we just only heard one from Kurt Wilson that eventually we'll hear something on the long term finances. Um, is there any general announcements by any of the board members? This is your opportunity. Tell us what's going on in your cities. Anything? Everybody's quiet. Okay. Well, um, I just thought I would make an announcement since we have Thanksgiving coming up. And, and then after that, we'll have the Christmas holiday. Just, um, you know, I was just thinking about, like we all do in November, it's a time for gratitude. And I know we've all been through so many things and so many people through this last couple of years with the pandemic and the coronavirus. And I, I, one thing that I've learned during that time is to be grateful for the little things. And so that would just, just give you a little bit of just uh, words of wisdom is to have an attitude of gratitude because I think people that have gratitude are happier people and more successful. So that's just a little announcement I just wanna say. And then our next meeting will be Thursday, February 17th at 11.30. And until then, we're looking at that still being a Zoom meeting and just wish you all a wonderful, wonderful month of November and December. Happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, goodbye everyone. Bye, stay safe. You too.